All right, everybody. So today on the podcast, we have Mario Tomish. How are you doing, man? Doing great. Nice to be here. So like we were saying before recording, I mean, we've both been in the space for, well, I've been in space for like three years. You're, you know, certainly much longer on your end, um, but we've been doing the whole fitness thing for a long time. I, I think we've probably seen each other's stuff, but we didn't connect until recently. Um, and, and I know you're close with Abel and, and you've been on other podcasts. So I figure let's get you on and, and kind of dive into it. So, you know, you were telling me before that you are traveling a lot, you've been able to maintain this online presence and, and basically be this digital nomad. Um, so I kind of wanted to get a little bit into your background, how do you get into the, the strength training world? But one of the things I saw you comment on, I believe, I think it was on my video, um, but somewhere where you were talking about like the strength levels that we see on YouTube and everything, everything is kind of warped. And it, it is funny though, because when you look at people like, you know, not the genetic freaks and actually I think Abel is kind of putting together a list of people's strengths now to kind of get an idea. Um, and I, I actually did that a couple of years ago. I was asking a lot of people like, you know, what are your measurements at a certain weight? Because I think it's helpful to get people's perspective on like, okay, we look this way in a photo, but how big is this person really? And not to say that that has anything to do with what they really know or anything like that, but to give more realistic standards. And, and I think what we've come to find is a lot of us kind of end up at a similar place, weight wise, strength wise, even like measurements wise after eight to 10 years. So I guess first question is, um, how long have you been lifting? And then we can get into maybe some of your stats. Yeah. So at this point, I've been continuously doing this for 11 years. So it's that no breaks, pretty serious since day one to now no major injuries, no major issues, no long pauses. I think the longest I ever took was probably like two weeks. And that was if I got a flu or something like that, where mm -hmm. I was forced to stop. But as far as me continuously training, I can say that there's never been sort of the intent of, oh, I'm going to stop this lifestyle. Once I got into it, I've just said, this is it. I'm going to do this for the rest of my life and let's rock and roll. Let's see how far we can take this naturally. And I'm specifically mentioning naturally because obviously things are very different if you're enhanced, right? So I'm, yeah. I'm specifically always referring from a perspective as a natural, because I do think these things that we all talk about, like you just mentioned expectations, we all have our own biases. I think one of the things that you mentioned earlier with being a digital nomad, so I've trained probably around 150 different gyms, probably even more, like probably two, wow. 300 gyms. If I, if I really have to think about it, because even in one city, you can train like three, four different gyms. So I've kind of observed over the years, what are people lifting? What's being done in a commercial gym setting? I know if you go around the US, I mean, there's specific strength gyms, you walk in and you know, it's more cherry picked and people are extremely strong. But if you go to your average gym in Hong Kong, your average gym in, in Germany, your average gym in, I don't know, in, in somewhere in, in Florida and then up mm -hmm. in Canada, you're not going to meet you know, people that are just rack, you know, four or five plates. Like they're yeah. just not that many people. So I, I'm, I'm glad we are kind of opening up with this topic. And uh, yeah, it's been a very long journey for me. I started as a software engineer, my career early on, transformed my body, lost about 40 pounds. And that got me to write about fitness because I got really deep into it. I have a more addictive extremist personality in general. So when I do something, I just go full force all into it. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't like to be casual when it comes to things. It comes all the way back to my early years. I was a professional gamer at some point. So I went wow. really, really hardcore into that as well. Um, hardcore into computer science, hardcore into fitness. So whatever I do, I try to really do to my maximum potential. So that mindset has always been uh, with me. It's uh, maybe from Dragon Ball or something. I don't yeah. even know. But at this point, it's always been about continuous improvement for me. So I'm always trying to level up as much as I can. So let's back up a sec. Are you a big Dragon Ball Z fan? Is that something you watch? Absolutely. Oh, I watched man. everything right. when it comes to Dragon Ball, like multiple times yeah. from even stuff that people don't even know exists, like fan stuff that's created somewhere in like a basement. Oh, wow. Nowhere. Okay. Even so, mangas and all that stuff. Yeah. I, uh, growing up, I was, I remember when I was like, I don't know, six, seven years old and my brother was watching it and it was Frieza Saga. And I, I was like, dude, like I would just, for no reason, I would just say he was lame. Right. So I was like, dude, what are you watching? And then I got super into it and we spent so much time as kids watching it. And it's funny to see in the lifting space, um, Steve Hall, Revive Stronger posts about it, like the different memes, Paul Canoe. Um, so my cousin was watching Dragon Ball Super and I was asking him about it, but I watched, cause the thing, the reason I saw it so many times, I watched it all through. And then when I was in high school, even I would work out in my basement, like middle school, high school. 
And I had all the episodes which you had to buy on like the VHS and then eventually like these like burn DVDs. And I would literally, when I would work out, just have it play all the time for years. So I saw every episode three, four times, like the 500 episodes. So I became very familiar with it. Um, and it was, it was I, don't, I wasn't somebody like, oh, it's what got me into lifting. But it was definitely like a big part of my childhood. And it's funny to see. I mean, it feels weird now. I'm 30. You said you're, I think, almost 35, right? Yeah, yeah. And so, but it definitely was, a, I think, a significant part of a lot of our childhood. Yeah, I don't know about you, but I always been fascinated by this superhero avatar, you know, whether it's you know Superman, D- DC stuff, whether mm-hmm. it's Marvel stuff, whether it's general comics and then Dragon Ball and any other anime. I was always fascinated by this you know, hero character. Totally. And, I mean, I didn't grow up popular or being the guy that get in any kind of attention or in sports or any kind of special yeah. talent. So a lot of this is sort of the hero's journey that we're mm. trying to have in our own lives because a lot of those heroes that you look for, they're, they're usually starting from a kind of like a dead end situation or they've just had a really troubled life and then become a hero through this whole uh, tri- trials and all this kind of stuff that they have to endure. It's like the same kind of story line with Goku, like there's a mistake, but he's trying to do it better and always mm-hmm. keep improving himself, working hard. So I guess if you don't have almost like it's an excuse if you don't have good genetics and stuff that you or a good environment you're trying to find inspiration that where hard work matters more than all that other stuff right so right right usually um usually that and and i would say i'm, I'm very biased toward that thing like you can be whatever you want to be that's yeah. my personal bias and even though i know that's i mean i'm not going to be lebron tomorrow but you know, right yeah you know, no I, well i'm sure jordan peterson would have a lot to say on that but uh i, I think you know you only have to look at the marvel movies to see that, you know, this like multi-billion dollar you know, success story of their movies and, and, and the, that there's a big reason behind that, right? And I think it captivates a lot of people. So, um, I, and I think a lot of people in the lifting world can relate to whether it, it is like some like anime or something like that, they can relate to this idea of, I mean, really when you, you look at it, I know Greg Knuckles and Eric Trexler both talked about this, like a lot of the people who, it's changing, but a lot of the people who were like the really successful power lifters and bodybuilders these were kind of weird people, right? I mean, they were people who they weren't the best athletes. And, and frankly, now, like I said, with the increased popularity, this is how we're seeing like these crazy things broken. Because frankly, the like the best, best athletes in the world were going into football, basketball, and other like mainstream sports. So if you look at the like, powerlifters, especially, you know, maybe like 80s, 90s, you know, 2000s, um, it was kind of like, weird people right the people who would be that person who is is socially isolated and will bring 10 tupperware jars to work and things like that right but it was like this is something i'm really good at i mean i remember seeing this woman when i was in i don't know ninth grade maybe and she was inclined like really heavy woman but she was inclined benching like you know 155 and at the time i could even do a flat bench with plates and you know she's just like repping this thing out and I mean, obviously, from my perspective as a 14 year old, I just thought, oh, here's this obese woman. But like, I'm sure in her world, that was like a sense of purpose, right? It gave you something to strive towards. And in your little niche, it gave you a feeling of belonging. And I think a lot of people can relate to that feeling of belonging and why the fitness community can be very tight. Yeah, I would agree with you. I think one of the beauties about fitness, and I talk to clients about this all the time, it's something that is within your locus of control and it gives you a very short-term positive feedback loop when you get into it, which mm-hmm. kind of draws you to do it more and more. Because at the end of the day, we humans respond really well to feedback loops. If you're consistently getting positive encouragement or result or movement forward and you can recognize it, that your life is getting better, you're feeling better, even if it's not objective, even if it's just subjective, you're going to be more drawn to that. I mean, obviously, we're all hooked on our phones, social medias, interacting with other people, food, all these other things kind of work on the similar loop. In fitness, it can be that as well for a lot of us. You go to the gym, you instantly feel better after a workout. You add you know, a small plate on each side, you feel better about that. It's a sense of accomplishment, but it's all your effort. It's not something that you can actually... Uh, you know, deny. It's just something that's happening right in front of you compared to, let's say, career success or something. Some of that, there's a lot of factors involved. There's mm-hmm. obviously lock positioning, environment, opportunities coming, going. But with fitness, you're just literally going there and deliberately making it happen. And it's also physical, which we kind of are also biased to value that physical effort you put in and you got the reward because it's painful, right? And anything you do painful does callous your mind and gets you out of your comfort zone. And uh, certainly fit lifting has done that for me. I was, I was a guy that has ne- never really been that, you know, passionate about 
any physical endeavor until I discovered gym. And yeah. I try to be a good soccer player, which in Croatia is the thing you do when you grow up. Like that's yeah. the thing. Like if you're not a soccer player as a short guy, like I am, like I'm five foot 10, 178. So I can't be a handball player because you need to be much larger, bigger, longer arms, not good genetics for that. Can't be yeah. a basketball player too short. Also guys here are generally taller than me. I'm naturally in Croatia, five foot 10 is, is not really that tall, yeah. especially in the area that I'm from. Like guys walk around in like six foot plus six foot is kind of average, right? So you're wow. just basically like a midget. So, <laughs> I mean, I'm trying to compete um, and you can't. And in soccer, I was not that good because in general, like I just didn't really find my own groove and practice and, and all of that. So over time, I just kind of gravitated toward video games and isolating myself, as you said, you know, be becoming a little bit more weirder, playing mm -hmm. more games, going to go to computers while everybody else was chasing girls and playing sports. And then college comes around, you get overweight because you do double down on the games and you're also studying and you're not moving physically as much. Your diet is all over the place. Yeah. And when in college got done, got into it, into fitness, and I realized this is something I can control. I mean, you know, I have a, a tool now that I can actually use to level myself up instead of leveling up the character in World of Warcraft. Why don't I just do it myself? Right. And game over, right? As soon as that clicks, you just embrace the journey, and, and here we are today. Awesome. Yeah. So you mentioned that you're 5'10, um, 178. You're pretty lean from the pictures I've seen. I don't know if those are like the current pictures, but um, rough body fat percentage on you. I would say I'm anywhere between 10 and 12% during summer times. So I stay around that level for around three to four months in a year. I do think it does um, help me appreciate uh, the bulks and the lean bulks. So, so here's my overall kind of game plan setup. Over many, many years, I try to spend about 80% of my time in either lean gaining or what you would call gain tanning, main gaining, whichever terminology you want to use. But if I'm going on a, let's say a, movement to a new city, I know my training is going to be suboptimal. So I'm going to go from lean bulking down in calories to make sure that because my partitioning is going to be terrible, if I'm just finding out a new gym, adjusting myself, I need a couple of weeks, I'm going to drop the calories, maybe even a month. And then eventually when I kind of get accustomed to it, I'm going to raise the calories a little bit and I'm going to try to make actual lean gains. And then if every once in a while, when I reach a top end of my body fat, which even if, it, if it's not high, objectively speaking, it's about 15, 16%, I can still see my abs because of lean mass that I have. Mm -hmm. I'm still going to want to drop it down from time to time. It's almost, I guess, intuitively thinking that there's some kind of resensitization if I have spent so much time pushing for gains that I want to actually tone it down and do a mini cut, lean out, and then try to go for gains again. And I've done these phases multiple times in the last five, six years specifically, in the beginning, I was not as deliberate. I started with a cut, lost about 40 pounds, and eventually I just started slowly gaining and more maintaining. But then mm -hmm. last five, six years, I started becoming a lot more strategic about it. And my ratio is, let's say, five to one at this point. So five to one, if I spend one month cutting, it has to be done after five months of gaining. So if I'm 10 months gaining, I'm not going to gain more than I can't lose in two months, right? So that's sort of the, the average that I take. So at this point, even 11 years in, you're still doing the Balkan cut cycles then? Like you're, you still are trying to put on some more mass? Yes. Uh, there are not Balkan cuts like you would say. You know, like it's not a roller coaster like you would sure. imagine. It's, we're talking about a very, very small surplus. I might start gaining at 76 kg, and a year and a half later, I might be at 80. Okay. So, yeah, which is like four yeah. kilos, you know, eight and a half pounds, nine pounds over the course of a year and a half. <laughs> so yeah, I'm not yeah. trying to do anything you know, dramatic because I like to wear the same clothes. Right. I like to have a system in my life that I don't have to overthink it and micromanage it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, at this point, I'm, I did the Balkan cut thing for a long time. And I do actually, I don't know. I mean, now with like uh, Greg, you said talking about gain taining or there was mean gaining and all that stuff. Uh, I'm not actually a big fan of that in somebody's earlier years. I really do think that you're going to leave progress on the table. And I, and I think that you can be more aggressive earlier on. Um, but after about 10 to 12 years, I was like, all right, like, let me do like a final, like really big gaining phase. And I spent two years gaining a lot of weight. I got up to about 220. Um, and I just found that at that point, I wasn't gaining anything else. Like I spent all that time gaining. And then I cut down and I literally netted like nothing. So I was like, all right, at this point I have fluctuations, but they're more like life fluctuations. You know, maybe for summer I get down into like the mid one eighties, uh, maybe during the winter, if I'm trying to get some more strength back, I'll go up to like closer to 200, but they're not 
it, it's something that at this point it's more i'm just trying to like enjoy things and if i can eke out a little bit more strength here and there cool but i don't i don't see too much of a change to be honest um and so at let's say like at 180 do you know your measurements like waistline or arm measurements i don't know my measurements i, I don't really measure myself and measure myself in in like for like seven, eight years. Wow, <laughs> I, don't okay. even remember. Time. I barely okay. ever take waist measurements. My proxy is, am I getting stronger and uh, more of a qualitative stuff with how my physique looks and specific body parts? Because I, I don't really try to gain everywhere at this point. Like there, mm. I know there's a lot of discussion. So, so there's a couple of things we can obviously open up here. But one thing I just want to, before we dive into that, like I've noticed that it's, we, we talk so much about genetic muscular potential. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, what we're really discussing here as, as men in our thirties and forties moving into sort of, or even after 23, 24, when you start getting serious about career and life in general, you're talking about what's your lifestyle muscular potential, not your genetic muscular potential. Because if I'm living a lifestyle that I'm living right now as an entrepreneur with lots of responsibility, stress, moving around, having all these things happen, can I actually maximize my genetic potential? Probably not. And I'm well aware of that because if I'm pushing business and there's so much stress that's impacting my recovery, I'm trying to juggle all these plates and balls up in the air. Everything is just really spinning around. I mean, I'm, most of the time, I would say 50% of the time, I know I'm not doing the most optimal workouts that I could be doing. Just the fact that I'm super mentally tired and when I get in there, I'm trying to rush it because I have a call coming up with a client. I have some things going on with YouTube. I got to jump on a topic, so I have to film it. So I'm rushing the workouts, cutting the volume. So a lot of this stuff ends up becoming a lifestyle limitation rather than a genetic limitation because I could probably squeeze in if I could really start going to peaks of volume, you could probably squeeze in more gains. But at this point now, I have to specialize as much as possible to grow maybe one single body part. Like let's say I'm going to do my side delts and I'm just going to focus on them for like a year. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be the primary focus. So volume there is going to be racked up high or chest. I'm going to do tail end of a volume for chest. I'm going to go up 18, 20 sets in those blocks of training for chest. And that's going to be it. Everything else is going to stay around 12, 14 sets. So I'm going to try to specialize for that body part for a long period of time until maybe next time it's going to be quads. And that's the, really the only way I, I've seen that I'm able to keep up with recovery because it's not, I mean, I love training. I would, I would train every day for like two or three hours. I mean, if you give me an opportunity because I can, I sleep about nine hours, but it's still not enough. I'm pretty mm -hmm. much crushed. I just did a workout. I just came back from a workout. Now at 40 minutes, uh, my strength level has dropped massively today just because I've been hitting it for six days in a row. And the reason why I hit six days in a row, because I know now for three days, I'm not going to be able to train because we mm -hmm. have a trip coming up to an island. We're going to go and have fun. My mom is coming here on Monday. So it's like all these things that you're thinking as an athlete, if you're really, really dedicated, you would cancel half that stuff. You would not right. think about your girlfriend and your, her dinner with you and your romantic time and going to the beach and chilling. And I think that's really where it, where it boils down to at this point, after 10, 11 years, you kind of start realizing you know, it's a, it's a trade-off, right? You have to find a Goldilocks zone where business, fitness, and relationships work together and still try to make progress. And I think that's really what a lot of people that I at least work with as clients also aim for, that they're not really trying to be, you know, hundred percent only on fitness. Cause it, I mean, after about 22, you can't really do that. Right. I mean, I don't yeah. see how, how that would work. Yeah, I suppose so. I mean, I, I agree with the majority of that. I think because Eric Trexler said something like that similar where he's, he said, well, you know, we don't know what would happen if you gave like a hundred percent of it. And, and, you know, like, I have no idea what, like what my potential is. And he even said something along the lines of, and, and, you know, I think I'm not, he said, I'm not even, I think I'm not even close to it. And I thought to myself, like, really though, because the reality, and don't get me wrong, like I, I really like Eric and I, I think he's a, one of the best resources in this space. But I just, in that kind of statement, I'm like, look, we know that over 10 years, the gains drop dramatically. We also know more and more that we, we find a lot of these things don't matter. I mean, if you look at like these research reviews, it's like, okay, they did this versus this. And like the results were neg negligible differences, right? Um, we know like what causes the majority of the results. So when I see that and I see it's like, okay, so I've done the eight meals a day and I dropped it to three, no difference. I used to eat two grams per pound of protein. I dropped it to one gram per pound of protein, no difference. I used to do fasted morning cardio every day, 
no difference. Like so many of these things I used to try, I've tried the ramping up sets of volume. I tried all that stuff. And so I've lived that life of absurd obsessiveness and it didn't really matter. So could we, you know, become just like a total social recluse and stay home and do everything we could for this endeavor? Sure. I personally believe that it actually would not make almost any difference, uh, like over time. Um, mm. yeah, like, again, I, I know some people will disagree with me. I just talked to one girl who was like, you know, I'm this way because I spend four hours a day, like exercise and everything. And I'm like, dude, I don't think that's the reason I, you know, I think you have solid genetics. You've done it for a long time. Um, and it's not to downplay the effort. I just, I do question when people like, I, I very much agree with what you're saying about it's a lifestyle max, right. Rather than a genetic potential max. Could we do something? Sure. I think sleep is probably one of the biggest things, right? If, if you are consistently getting six hours of sleep and you genuinely were to get like nine hours of sleep every night instead, I think that could make a significant difference. If you're consistently missing meals and now you're always on point with your, you know, your macronutrients every day, I think that could make a difference. Um, but I just kind of shy away from the standpoint of like, you know, if, if I was hitting the gym twice as much, or if I was like doubling my protein, things like that, that sometimes people hear, you know, they're pretty close. I would say both when I say lifestyle max, genetic max, I think they're pretty close. I don't think there's a huge difference between them, maybe mm -hmm. about 10% or so. So if I would lean down uh, instead of being at 10% at, you know, 172 pounds, I might be 10% at 175, you know, I was just able to keep a little bit more muscle on me. Yeah. And um, I'd be able to train harder, uh, probably if I were to actually have more of a chilled and relaxed life, because right now it's not chilled and relaxed. Right. You know, you, when you're in your thirties, you're, you're essentially building the foundation of your entire life in a sense, uh, thinking really, really long-term. Mm -hmm. So you kind of have to put some things in place to reorganize your priorities. But yeah, I would, I would say, I agree with you. I think time is the great equalizer. Because if you just pour more time into the fundamentals, the fundamentals will eventually get you to a point of diminishing returns where you're really talking about very, very small percentages. And after a decade of this, doing it consistently, I'm, well, I'm at a point where I accepted that my physique is not going to dramatically change for the rest of my life uh, mm -hmm. in any you know, huge way. I mean, I'm, I'm actually, actually more excited about trying to see how far I can maintain Mm -hmm. this type of physique in my 60s and my 70s and seeing how far yeah. I can take it from a longevity, health and energy perspective and stay vital and, and active and do all these other things. I, I think that's what really excites me way more than just a hey, get two pounds more muscle on me because I don't think even if you get it, it's not going to change your physique. Where does it even go? I mean, right. where, where is it? Like, you know, yeah. two pounds of muscle across the entire physique, my glute gets 3% bigger. Does that even right. matter? Like, you <laughs> yeah. know, does, does even, does someone even see if my calf got a little bit bigger and you can get, get your calves 10% bigger. Does that any, does that even matter at yeah. the end of the day? You know, again, you get your broad strokes of your physique, you get it about five years in, you can kind of see what roughly you're going to look at. And yes, sure. You can get better over time. You can be leaner and heavier, but it, that's it. That, that's what you're dealing with. Yeah. And yeah, I, that's what people don't want to hear. <laughs> and think right. that they want to hear that you can be like Chris Hemsworth you know, yeah. tomorrow, but it's it's just not going to happen, right? Yeah, well, that's you know, I think my podcast will never be, or my channel even will never be this like super popular channel because, and that's like not what I'm going for because it's I I really want people to be realistic, and obviously it's great to like you know you're 20 years in and you're like, hey, well, I just tried this new supination of my curls, and wow, I put on like another inch. It's like. That's just not realistic. And there is, I will say, it was very hard for me to accept that like things were just kind of done, you know, because I really love that period of like, you read a new article, you find a new routine and there's this excitement and you're like, this is it. And that's really awesome. And if you are in your first one to six years of training, like really enjoy that period. Or even if you're later in your training, but you haven't done things ideally, it's, it's really great. I, I like that phase a lot. And I really like to be able to delve into it. But I totally agree with what you said. There's almost like a, a relief where you feel like, okay, it's not such a big deal now if, if it's not perfect. And like you said, like now at 30, it's kind of like, can I also look like this at 40? Like that would be pretty great. Like, you know, I mean, maybe it's not the perfect physique, but it's, you know, at, it's almost like a, a war of attrition with age, right? If, if, if you've noticed, like you're, you got your, wherever you're at in like high school, right? And then people start to like, get fatter or, you know, whatever people are bald in or they got crappy jobs or whatever. And then, like, if you can just kind of maintain, you start to become relatively better, which obviously is a, I'm not saying like that's, that should be your motivation, but, uh, 
I, I think it's, it's good to try to, I think your perspective, just talking to you about it, it it's, it's a very healthy mindset. And I think it's, it should be looked as a positive that you can do that. Yeah, I like the concept. I think you probably heard about this. It's called the infinite game concept. It's written about in the 70s and 80s. Mm -hmm. So you essentially look at pursuits like fitness. It's not a pursuit that has an end goal. Like what is the end goal, actually? There is none. I mean, for me, right. at least, if it's an infinite game, if I'm a competitor or let's say you're getting a degree, I got a, a master's in computer science, you have your degree. Look, you work hard for it, you got the degree and it's done. You have the degree, it stays with you. Yeah. But fitness is an infinite game in a sense that if you stop doing it, you're going to lose the result that you achieve by doing it. So yeah. you can never really stop. So there, there's really no end goal to this except actually to keep going and doing it. And the way I see fitness at this point in my life is even if I gain zero gains for the rest of my life, I would be very, very happy with that. Even if I started losing slower, I'd be happy with that because it's about really enjoying the process and what I get out of it from going there. Mm -hmm. It's literally therapy for me for getting out of all yeah. the you know, stuff that's happening in life yep. and uh, all the you know, obligations mentally. You're pushing yourself physically. It gives you mentally. If you come back, you're way more creative. I've noticed that my best video ideas come after I've done a workout, come back mm -hmm. home. I'm just thinking about stuff in there seeing something in the gym that inspires me making a video about it. But people ask like, where do you get your video ideas? You just go to the gym, see what guys right. are doing, not getting results. And you see the same guy there for like four years, like, yeah. okay, they haven't gained anything. Right. So you just like, <laughs> take that. It's, it's sad to say, but the reality of it, of it is that, you know, a lot of people don't realize that it's not about, um, you know, the special gimmickry that you see on YouTube or you know, this is, this is whatever special 10 versions of a curl. It is uh, mastering the fundamentals and actually never stop the fundamentals and uh, the master essentially never stops doing the basics. Like that's mm -hmm. what I've realized over the years. It's someone who is continuously on top of their macros, continuously somewhat on top of their calories, not, I mean, being OCD about it, but continuously having some level of awareness of it, continuously trying to apply tension to the muscle and progressive overload, not forgetting, not getting lost in the gimmickry of chasing, I don't know, the pump and that's, you know, special angle of something or mm -hmm. some weird uh, little technique and not forgetting the main thing. And if you just do the main things and give it enough time, I do think you're going to maximize whatever, you know, but get pretty close to the maximum that you can get over time. As long as you're rough ballpark of volume, rough ballpark of, of things, and even the volume thing, I mean, we can talk about this a lot and there's this, always this debate. Is it volume? Is it intensity? Is it, what is it, right? You, you got a low volume routine. This guy's blowing up and training each body part with eight sets a week. And there's someone else saying, Hey, you need to do 30 sets a mm -hmm. week to grow. I mean, we're so different at the end of the day that just this argument of what's optimal is it, just nonsense because we're also at the end of the day different. If you try to do, and I, I mean, I tried these 20, 20 sets plus per week for my quads, I get quad tendon inflammation in the fourth, fifth week. Every yep. single time I try to do it, can't, can't do it for me, right? doesn't work. So even if it was more optimal, it's not optimal. So you, right. what am I going to do now? I'm going to cry that I can't do it. So instead, I'm going to try to compensate for that by doing a bit higher intensity at lower volumes and still keep progressing there because I, I do almost see that progressive overload is a validator whether your volume is actually working or not. If I'm still able to progressive overload at 12 sets a week, why would I want to do 14 sets a week if I've just validated that volume is still effective for me to some extent? Yep. And if it's not effective, I can always tone it down a little bit and then get back into it and make it effective again because I can offload a little bit Resynthesize and try again. So I, I'm a lot less concerned about volume as I used to be when the initial studies came out by Brad. Mm -hmm. And now there's all a discussion of, you know, you just ramp it up. And back in 2016, I was pushing everything up to blocks of 20, 25 sets per week. I was really going hard at it. I was training full body every single day. Um, that was inspired by Menno. <laughs> we worked a little bit together. Wow. And as, as he was uh, coaching me, it's like a brutal routine, man. It's like killing but, you know, yourself in the gym every single time for two hours. And then, um, then the gains weren't that much better. I mean, you just really don't see much, much of a difference and you do rack up, uh, some aches and pains pretty quickly as well. So I've been becoming a lot more modest in that range of, I would say for me personally, between 12 and 16 sets per week, usually, but let's say 10 yeah. to 15. And then I would rack up some body parts a bit higher and, um, Anyways, long, yeah. long story short. No, I mean, the majority of my clients, I would say, are people who have at some point 
bought into this idea of like the super high volume stuff and found that it's not doing a lot or sometimes they, they still believe it i mean i've literally had a couple who they're they're almost not willing to listen to me and then they just find over time like oh like this has just not been working this like super high volume or not working any better you know people are consistently surprised that they can cut back so much and still get good results and like you know, I don't want to be that person who's like, you know, we can get the same results doing like nothing and just work out once a week and, you know, eat one meal a day and you're fine. It's not like that at all. But like, I am glad to see that after maybe five years or so, it looks like people are finally, you know, pulling the reins in on this super high volume stuff. Um, not that it has no applicability. I mean, it, it obviously does at certain points or phases. Um, but I... I think your anecdote is something I've heard dozens and dozens of times of, well, I tried ramping up volume a lot, didn't really notice any difference. I mean, I hear that 10 times more than I hear the opposite of, hey, I ramped up volume and everything just got so much better and was more impressive. I really don't hear that very often. Yeah, the, the RP debate is always, you know, should you train at 9 RP, 8, 8 9 RP all the time? And I've seen really good results actually varying RP quite a lot. I mean, range not just from seven to 10, but actually doing weeks of training at RP4, RP5, and just taking a step back for several weeks. And that's when I mentioned earlier to you why, you know, sometimes if I'm looking at a suboptimal phase in my life, when I'm on a vacation for two weeks, and I know the gym is going to be shitting on an island somewhere in Greece, and it's going to be half broken equipment. Well, I'm going to decrease the caloric intake, not going to make you know, a lot of lean gains. And I'm going to take this phase of training with really sub suboptimal RP. But mm -hmm. then when I come back into and I start ramping up, it just, everything becomes a lot more effective. And, and so it's almost over the years, initially when that whole Martin Burkham, you know, just do three exercises, you know, that yeah, type of yeah, stuff yeah. came out and I was switching to that. I started seeing some great results from that. Eventually the results stopped. I go back to higher volumes, start seeing results, go back to that, start seeing results. It's just literally changing it from, high intensity, low volume to a bit higher volume, lower intensity seems to be actually the best of both worlds, at least what I'm noticing. And specialization at the end of the day becomes really the, the only thing that I would say volume for me personally has been a good revelation is that I can amp up my tricep volume. I can amp up my side delt volume because there are certain body parts, whether genetically or biomechanically, that just need more. Yeah, I, I don't know why, but they just need more. The, the exercises are not hitting it enough if you just stick to the same amount of volume. So this is where I, I would dedicate like a year to my shoulders and just try to add more, much more volume there and keep everything else the same. And that's kind of been working really well so far. I don't know how, how well at, you know, at the end of the day, it's still like, you know, maybe a half a pound difference. Does it even matter? Or is just me trying to right. find ways to stay excited about the journey? Because that's also something you have to acknowledge, right? How yeah. do you stay excited about this at the end of the day? If your performance driven, like I am, you know, like you got to find something to be excited yeah. about. And if, if you don't do it, like what the hell are you know, like, what are you doing? That's where a lot of my thoughts go towards nowadays, because so specialization phases are interesting. And we can definitely dive into that because like that's something I, I mean, going back even 10 years, I remember reading articles on like how when you get to a certain advanced level, that's really all, what you got to do, because what the, the amount of work needed to grow a muscle group is too much to do across the body. So you have to basically break it up. So I've done specialization phases for everything kind of at this point, but, um, largely it's, it's been, I've done a few back, um, definitely a number of arm specialization phases and, uh, also for specific movements. Now from a strength standpoint, I've noticed pretty clear benefits. You know, when I hit 30 pull-ups, I was doing them very regularly when I hit, um, when I was going like do 225 overhead press, cause I did I did 205 for three and the next week, 225. And then within like a month of stopping the specialization, it just like crashed. Like there was a pretty clear correlation there between my increased volume and frequency and getting mm -hmm. that increased strength. Um, but the point was, while it's helpful, I, I sometimes wonder if it helped a lot long term. And I don't, I'm not saying I have an answer here. It's just like if I would do a specialization phase on my arms, let's say I did. Now you're talking about like months and months and months, and maybe that's a yeah. difference. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm talking these like specialization phases of like, you'd see these routines on my teenage and like one month arm specialization, and, and I gain like a quarter inch on my arms, but it's, you know, probably like some inflammation and, you know, more glycogen, and then it kind of goes away. 
a longer period of time, I think makes more sense, right? With the actually like, like mechanistically how you'd actually progress there. Um, and I've, I've done that, but I, I do it more for like, again, movements, overhead press and pull-ups being two that I've definitely focused on. Um, so you feel like when you've kind of gone into those higher volume phases for that long of a period of time, you've been able to see tangible increases yeah. So if, if you were to take it, getting a little bit nerdy about it, if you were to do, let's say something like DUP for an overhead press, and you would just really take that and you really block it out and plan it out to do a proper volume phase, then you intensify over the course of a year, start getting really, really strong at it. Then after the year, you could switch to, let's say doing a chest specialization phase, but the working set weight stays a little bit higher after that year of specializing for the overhead press. So if I started this year, I'm just going to throw out some numbers. If I started this year, my working volume was, um, let's say 135 for 12. That was sort of like the classic 12 sets, 135 overhead pressing. You can do four sets straight for 12. Great. The goal would be after a year, the next volume phase when I'm doing an overhead press, and now I'm not specializing it anymore. I'm specializing for chest that I can remain that overhead press around 140 for 12, let's say. So I've actually been able to now gain more strength objectively, but it's more of keep, can I get that same amount of volume with a higher weight? So does any, does anything stay long-term as you, as you said, now you can do a month specialization phase. Sure. Yeah. You can overhead press, let's say 225, but what's the point if next time you're not specializing, the volume goes back to baseline and you can just do the same amount of reps with the same weight you did before. Right. And Clearly that makes no sense to me, but it, it does make a lot of sense. If I can increase my baseline standard work between eight to 12, if it's gradually going up over, over years, that's what I'm really interested in. Not Definitely. necessarily strength work between three and five. I don't really do much. I mean, I do it in an intensification phase, but I'm not using that as a metric to measure progress long-term because the one RM, you can specialize for it. Obviously you can prepare for it. A lot of neuromuscular adaptations, you properly taper peak and grade, you can get it. But does that actually translate to muscle growth? Because I'm right. a hypertrophy focused athlete. I don't care about powerlifting. So yeah, for me, yeah. that's that's the goal. Yeah, and that I totally agree there. And that's kind of why I've almost started to shy away from it because I have found that it, it is transient, at least with the strength. Now, with the muscle size, is it possible? I maybe as we talked about, it's such it's very hard to measure these small changes, right? Maybe if I didn't like arms, I guess it, you know, going back to the measurements thing maybe I could pick up if I put an eighth of an inch on my arms, you know, I've measured my arms so many times, I probably could pick that up. But like, you know, if I put 3% more muscle in my delts, how could I even possibly hope to measure that? Right. I, I mean, it'd be yeah. pretty much impossible. Um, but as you said, yeah, if you have maybe slightly more, like, like if you're doing the exact same volume, you're doing just, you know, generic three sets of 10 with whatever weight on overhead press. And now you can put on five more pounds onto that barbell, then I'd say that's legitimate, you know? Um, but it is very hard to tell. And I didn't get it. I didn't want to be in a situation where, okay, I do a, a back specialization or a pull-up specialization and I go up, but then when I stop, I go down and I do overhead press and I go up and I go down. But at that point, it's, I've done it for fun. Like we talked about it. You have to find things to motivate you. And for me to hit a lifetime PR on an overhead press was motivating, you know, to hit a lifetime PR on really anything at this point is motivating, but I go into an understanding. This is probably a lot of neurological adaptation. You know, it's probably, it's not going to last, but it still gives me something to do, which frankly, as you said, like we, you have to address that. If you've been doing this 15 years, you have to address the aspect of, well, I could go in and just be bored out of my mind where I could find things that are actually fun to do. 100% same, not just with Jim, but it I mean with YouTube videos as well. Mm. People kind of ask me, Mario, why did you, you know, improve or, or like your videos are so much better now? Yeah, yeah, that's partially because I want the audience to have the best experience. But it's also for me personally, I like to have some mastery over it. So I can start adding some effects, I can start improving my cameras, equipment, investing things, because it keeps me excited about the process. So it yeah. works both ways. The same thing is with, with training, the same thing is with, with dieting and, and seeing where you want to take this thing. I, I, and yeah, I think the measurement, and I'm, maybe I'm a bit of a too long-term person at this point, because I just kind of, when someone says they're doing something for a month in the gym and they've been lifting for a while, I'm just like, oh, whatever, dude, like you can do anything for a month. It doesn't matter. I can just eat OMAD fast half the month. And whatever, in two months, I'm going to be back where I was. Like, it doesn't make yeah. any difference. But yeah. if you tell me you're doing something for eight to 12 months, 
now we got something right now now we can work out if there's some tangible difference if my overhead now went up to 145 for 12 and i can actually keep it there with now lower volumes i'm good and i think that's where that's kind of what i'm looking for obviously you know, five pounds over a year, not, a, not something to be super excited about, but I mean, I do get excited about, it. I got my fractional plates in my back and I yeah. just go there and people are like, look, who is this weird dude? What the hell is he bringing? Like some rings, putting on yeah. plates. Right. And, it, <laughs> and I don't see that actually happening in the gyms. You almost never see someone using a fractional plate and overhead press. I haven't seen that once in probably like eight years that I've seen someone do that. Yeah. And it, it's silly, you know, thinking that you can just pack on, you know, suddenly five pounds week to week. And you see these guys coming to the gym and go there for a decade and thinking that they can add five pounds and they were press. Like, how are you going to do that? Like, if you I had a pound, to, I'm happy. So I don't know if those are real numbers, but this kind of ties back into, you know, the original topic of, uh, we talked about your weight and, and some strength measurements. So for yep. some of the relatable lifts, I mean, cause it's hard because some people like, I know when I discuss strength with Abel, he does a lot of machine work, so it's hard to really mm. compare strength. But if you do some of like the more major movements, what are some of your strength numbers? So um, working weights. So I usually mm -hmm. I, I would measure it between six to ten. That's sort of my working weight. So yep. uh, and I'm going to use kilos because I've been in Europe now for a while, so it's easier for me to. If you want to convert right, to pounds, get the calculator multi out. Yeah. multiply by <laughs> two plus ten percent. You want an easy way to calculate kilos to pounds times two plus 10%, then you're only going to be 0.02% off, something like that, 0.2% off. So anyways, okay. um, so I just did a chin up this um, Wednesday. So that's two days ago, uh, 40 kg for set of five clean reps, touching the top with my shoulder all the way down to right. full stretch all the way up. I pounds, did. Just... Yeah, that, that's, yeah, that's, that's 88 pounds, right? Mm -hmm. So that if, if you want to go calculate, um, then the incline dumbbell press. Um, that's literally what I just did. That's for 48 kg dumbbells in each hand, uh, for set of seven last time I did it. Yeah. Set of seven. So okay. I, I aim to be between six and 10. So it's seven. I'm going to stay at this way until I can hit 10, then I'm going to go up to the fifties. So that's, um, what is that? Yeah. Whatever. Pound pounds, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Whatever that is. Um, the, what else? Uh, my squat is pretty weak. So I'm, I would be able to uh, three plates for a set of five, six, you know, that's pretty weak. Yeah. I'm not, not that heavy. Now it's not, my squat is like the, one of my weakest lifts, uh, yeah. objectively. And the last time I did like was 130 kg for eight and the RP was still reasonable. So yeah, that, that's all right. My RDL, I RDL with perfect form, 180 kilos for a set of eight. So that was like my maximum that I ever did. So with perfect okay. form, so all the way down, like clean, solid, very slow, controlled hips all the way back, you know, that type of stuff, not super deep where my back gets fried and killed. So yeah, that would be 180 kg. Mm -hmm. So that's something I'm really proud of because RDLs was like one of my weakest lifts for a while. And I just really, really focused on it. I stopped deadlifting. I haven't deadlifted in like five years. I just already, okay. I'm going to nail it. Right. I'm just going to crush it. Uh, Bulgarian split squats. I done, um, Last time in 2016, I was actually working with Menno. Uh, that was my all time PR there. I did, and then I, I'd use pounds. So that was um, 110 pound dumbbells mm. for sets of eight. So that was okay. like my heaviest because Menno was really big on Bulgarian split squats and a lot of unilateral work. It, it freaking yeah. killed me, but it was really, really Sucks, worth man. it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was really worth it for my leg growth. I think I grew a lot more than from squats for some really? reason. Like it really, yeah, it just really helped a ton. Huh. Um, barbell bench pressing, I did um, for reps. I think my max was a 120 for eight, like super clean controlled. So okay. that's like 120 for eight sets of eight. Like, you know, I could do three sets of eight. That, that was all right. Bench that's is good. actually almost as good as my squat, which is really weird. Yeah, that's like 265 chest. for eight. That's pretty solid. Yeah, my chest is pretty, not, not that well developed. And, and, and that's just interesting. I mean, I'm very critical of my chest. Um, mm. On the push ups, I've done um, sets of 20 with 50 on my back. So okay. that was. That's something I'm really proud of because push-up is actually my primary chest exercise that I kept for the last since uh, 2007, 2006, uh, sorry, 2017. Yeah. That's just been my primary move, right? I haven't removed push-ups from my training since then. Mm. So it's been for the last four years, so weighted push-ups have been, yes, 50 kg. Yeah. For, for a set of 20. 
So okay. that that's been something I'm really happy with. And I'm trying to like actually ramp that up. The difficulty becomes logistical to find people in the gym that can actually put the weights on you and take them off and not fall right, off. Right, right, right. So in, in a couple of gyms, I've been, it. yeah, it's been really criti- critical to find like gyms that actually have 50 kilo plates. There's a mm-hmm. few that I've found in Europe, which was great. Uh, what else? Um, overhead pressing. Um, that would be like 70 for eight. That's like my best overhead press. I, I'm really not that good at overhead pressing. So 70 for eight. That's probably my lift that I'm going to now specialize in. The, that's like my final frontier, like get good at yeah. overhead pressing. Because when I do overhead pressing, I get, there's this this weird effect. Like when I'm sitting, I can just do a lot more weight. But when I'm standing, sure. I have yeah. uh, my spine has, I have a lot of anterior pelvic tilt. It forces me into it as soon as weight goes up a little bit. And that I think is becomes a limit factor for me. I started really feeling my back a lot, even though I really push the posterior pelvic tilt as much as I can squeeze the glutes as much as I can. I haven't tried a belt. Maybe the belt would actually help mm-hmm. me kind of get my core in place. Um, I think two limit factors. One is the naturally really good arch, which I've actually practiced a lot doing barbell bench pressing over the years. So my arch now is starting to hurt me in the overhead press because I got a really good arch mm. in the bench. Now, when I were pressing the arch is not that good because I don't have good lat mobility. So right. literally I can't like that. That's you know the most I can, I can't get the arms back. <laughs> so right, right. It becomes like a limit factor. So I think that's one thing that I have to work on a lot more, uh, but yeah, I'm pretty happy with the numbers actually. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, it's very in line with what I would expect as far as like when we were talking to a lot of people um, and I, I don't know if, I don't want to steal Abel Slender. I think he's kind of putting together like a thing here with everybody, but your pull up is like, so for reference, so you did 88 for five. Uh, I probably could do about a hundred for five. So very similar. Um, your best bench 265 for eight. Uh, I did high reps. I, I did recently get 225 for 16, but if I were to put 265 on, it would probably be seven to eight. I would guess, you know, um, overhead press, you said what's equivalent to 155 for eight, which I don't think is bad at all. I mean, I, I think that's pretty solid. Um, I'd probably be in that same. I mean, honestly, it's almost identical numbers. And um, maybe like my deadlift and squat were stronger, but other than that, not not too much. I will say I hate Bulgarian squat squats. They suck. <laughs> they kill my ankle. That, that's what's also annoying. That ankle. Oh, that goes really? Back, yeah, hmm. it eventually just hurts. Um, I find it hard to, there's certain movements that I find it hard to be consistent with form. And that's one of them where like, like a regular deadlift or a squat, like I go down, I hit that point, I go up with Mm. split squats, how much I use my back leg can change how much weight I can use by like 20%. Like I can really try to just emphasize the front leg, but it's hard if you're pushing to failure to like, not at all use that back leg. I just find it, it's hard to be consistent. That's very true. Like the setup that I've been using now for the Bulgarian split squat is on a Smith machine. I would put that um, hip thrust pad on the machine and that's where I would put my ankle and my leg. And I would actually put it lower because if it's higher, it's assisting me way more than if I put it lower. Yeah. And what I've done when I actually hit those um, 110 in each hand, I've done a, a switched over to a deficit Bulgarian split squat afterwards. And my wind went down to about 90. So I started doing with a deficit. So like where your knee 90, would allow you to go even lower. Yeah. I could go even deeper. Yeah. So deficit Bulgarian, if you hate Bulgarian split squats, do deficit Bulgarian split squats. Then the <laughs> normal Bulgarian split squat will feel amazing. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> That's the secret. Just add yeah. a deficit. If you had lunges, just do deficit lunges for a oh. while. Or if you had deadlifts, do deficit. <laughs> yeah. So, I used yeah. to do deficit deadlifts a lot. And those actually really helped my, regular deadlift um mm-hmm. and i'm not saying but like i do think bulgarian split squats are a good exercise i just really don't like to do them um but they they are solid i used to do them a lot in college and i got up to pretty heavy weights then i think i want to say 120s for five or something like that mm, that's um, good and that's good. um but yeah but it's also one of those lifts that like nobody does so people who see it think it's really impressive because like you know, like just not a lot of people do that. Even in my college back then, I don't know if deadlifting just wasn't as popular, but like every bro benches. Right. So Mm -hmm. back in college, I think I was maybe doing 225 for five bench. So that was like very standard. Nobody was impressed, but 
but I was deadlifting 405 for like six. And in most bros in college at the time, at least weren't deadlifting. So I had like the strongest deadlift in the gym because at that gym, like nobody did it. Now I see more and more people doing, although you still don't see that many people ripping out four to five plates in a, in a commercial gym. I don't see it much. Yeah, I don't, I don't see it. I mean, if you walked into any of the gyms I've been to, you would be like the strongest or maybe one other guy would be stronger than you mm -hmm. with these numbers that we were just talking about. And when I walk yeah. into the gym, it's very, very rare that I see someone doing anything that's impressive. With deadlifting, RDLs have been a game changer just because I don't actually have access to proper powerlifting gyms where I can properly chalk up and actually you know, put the weights down the way I like to deadlift, which is not do a, you know, a strong negative. If I just break my back and add so much fatigue, right? I would actually, ideally, I would be deadlifting in 200, 210, 220, try to push my deadlift, but I, it's impractical. In a commercial gym, if you start bringing chalk, if you drop the weight, mm -hmm. right? They're going to just be, it's going to cause so many issues even in this gym that I'm in right now, even the RDL, like if you, you know, if it starts, weight starts clapping, you know, everybody's, that, that's just the kind of those logistical limitations that you kind of have to work around. I think the RDL translates really well to the regular deadlift. Like if you're super strong at the RDL, yeah. you're a beast. I, I think that even the RDL, like when, when you put it on like four plates on each side, like the entire gym is pretty, mm -hmm. you know, like people are like, okay, what the hell is this guy doing? Because yeah. It's, it's very rare to ever see someone go above three plates, let alone go up to four plates. I've done in Mexico, I've done five plates. I just literally, I was training with two buddies and um, I was like, okay, fuck it, let's do it. And, and I never do, it, I'm really paranoid with about, I never got injured like seriously. So I'm always like really cautious, Yeah. but you know, testosterone training with other people. I also train mostly alone. So it's kind of like that thing when you right. finally train with someone, you want to really show off Yeah. and we're okay, there are like three plates. I'm like, let's try five plates. And I did a, I did a set of four. It wasn't with perfect form. There was some, there were some back rounding, but not as much as I thought when I was looking at the yeah. footage later, I used a belt as well. And a belt actually makes a big difference. I normally oh, yeah. don't do any belt training. Okay. So belt is huge belt. I mean, in a squat, if you had a belt, like, I don't know how much it helps you, but I've noticed if you've done beltless squat, you put a belt on, 15% oh, yeah. extra instantly. Like it's crazy. I'm more upright. I can rely on the belt to bounce out mm -hmm. huge. So belt is, is a game changer. If you, if you add that in, but without a belt, like four plates is, is huge. And if, in that context, uh, going back to the movement that I wanted to kick everybody's butt, I told everybody now we're going to do walking lunges, a barbell walking lunges. Mm -hmm. The gym had a lot of open space. Okay. And one of my friends that I was, uh, he, he was sort of jaggedly going to the gym, but he's never really, you know, he's kind of like intermediate. He's never really kind of trained super hard to our mm -hmm. B10. And we're like, look, you, you're going to do walking lunges until you can't get up anymore. It's simple, right? Until you cannot. <laughs> and we racked up, I think I did about uh, 185 and I was just okay. like as many as I could. He, he did like 135, which is a lot for him. And yeah. we do like three circles and uh, he was on anti-inflammatories for like three days. <laughs> he, did, like, he got high fever oh my god <laughs> yeah <laughs> it was so much and it, after that exercise like everything went downhill in the entire training session that was the first <laughs> exercise and everything oh, else wow. just like okay. done <laughs> yeah i uh my time in uh i guess it was my senior year of college and it was my first time ever deadlifting 405 but unlike a lot of people like i never tried to do like for one i was just going up and wait for mm -hmm. like fives so the previous week I did like 385 for five and I was still gaining pretty quickly. So then it was like 395, whatever. So I put on 405 and I'm already amped up because it's my first time ever lifting this weight. But again, it's a college gym. I know a lot of the guys there. So I load it up and like everybody in this gym is watching me. So I hit my five and I was like, okay, not even that hard. Like I was like, okay, solid, but everybody's watching me. So I'm like, all right, let's see if I can get a six one. I got the six one. Dude, I messed up my back. I couldn't put socks on for like two weeks without it being like a five minute process. Like I just, it was so dumb, um, but it was a very ego lift. And I, I don't even know if I ever fully recovered because now like I, I still tweak my back every once in a while in that same area. Um, so deadlifts, I, I don't do them as much now because that was always my favorite lift. It was the lift I was best at. It was obviously like a very ego lift for me, like most weight. Um, but yeah, you got to watch out when you're working out with the bros, man. Dude, we're lucky. Yeah, we're, we're I mean, I, I was, I'm, I'm so lucky with, with not getting hurt. Um, once in Japan, I put like 130 kg on my bench and I was at the time I was benching more like powerlifting. I was trying to like really get strong. So it was sets of three 
So that was, that was the goal. I was back in uh, 2014, 2015. I was trying to test like my one hour. I mean, I was just, my warm up were essentially singles. I would do singles until it got super hard. Then I would do volume work. That mm -hmm. was sort of the system that I followed. Didn't really got it from anybody. I just kind of thought that was the thing, right? It, it wasn't really a program or anything. And um, I don't know if it ever happened to you, but I, I, I blacked out as I was unracking the bench. Oh, wow. But oh. I didn't actually get it out. So I didn't get it out of the, um, of the J hooks. Okay. And there was like this random guy there, quote unquote, spotting me. But if, if I actually got it out, I would have died for sure, but I didn't wow. get it out. So it just kind of, my wrist just went, went back and, and re-racked the weight. And I just like did like this and I just opened up my eyes, weight is back up. And I was like, holy shit. Cause I, I really hyped myself up. Mm -hmm. I was like hyperventilating. I wanted to really be super core tight. My belt was on. I was just really hyped up to do the lift. And I think I just uh, put too much pressure on, on my, uh, on myself in, in that moment. And, uh, those types of situations, like you, you kind of have to look back sometimes, like it's pretty crazy. Like what you do, um, as a younger dude. And at that time, you know, in my twenties, I was like, so just, let's just rack up weight. Let's just do as much as I can. So yeah, it's, it's gotta be luck. I mean, it's, it's luck. Like, honestly, it was the yeah. stupidest thing. Like when I think back. I'm scared. Like when I think back, like you could, I, I mean, it's instant death, like instant death. Like if you just drop, like the go straight on your neck or your head, you're done. Yeah. Like instant. Yeah. I used to do guillotine presses a lot actually. And now I look back and I was like, Oh, that was questionable. And then I have some friends who do a lot of false grip benching, which I'm not a fan of. Um, and I, I yeah. do still get lightheaded sometimes, but not, I try to avoid it with bench, but I will say again, the ego kicks in sometimes, but for deadlifts, definitely a lot. Cause I have fairly low blood pressure. And so like with my deadlifts, like I would do a rep and I'd kind of like see stars and I was like, Oh, this is questionable. But the one I just thought of that you were talking about, like hyping yourself up, I think it was actually when I went for the 225 overhead press and I, I don't like ever have caffeine anymore, like almost never. And Same. I, that day, because I'm an idiot, had four cups of coffee. I put in like crazy music and I was thinking about like, like stuff that like, you know, just really like kind of like darker thoughts, just like trying to get in like the, the mindset for it. And that day I failed it. It was actually later when I was like a little bit more calm that I, I had better results, but I was too hyped up. I, it was like, I was shaking. I was just like, I put too much emphasis on it. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I really couldn't perform. I mean, it was like, I remember after that day i was like i'm never doing anything like that again like i just felt so it felt so unhealthy first of all but secondly i just i just did not feel like i could perform optimally but you know sometimes we just have something that we really want to achieve and, and you just put everything into it yeah you choke i think that's the official term at the end mm -hmm. you know it's you put so much mental effort into it you're so much thought into it that your body can't even perform what it knows how to do um, and lightheadedness for me, it's very common. When I'm overhead pressing. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably one of the, the things that really holds back the overhead press, at least for me personally, when I go up to about my body weight. So if I'm doing, cause my body weight is not that, that much from my repping weight. So when I go a little bit above my body weight, it just starts uh, to reflect. I don't really get as much light as I used to. I'm not sure why it used to happen to me a lot when I would be lying down on a couch, I would stand up, I would have to like sit back down. I don't know if it doesn't happen as much anymore, but it used to happen quite a lot. Yeah. Probably. Um, I don't know what's the, what was the issue? Yeah. Well, I mean, so when you stand up too quickly and, and you know, they call it orthostatic yeah. hypotension and, um, I used to get that all the time just standing up. I mean, I still get it a little bit and there's also something called POTS, which on extreme level you, you get, um, really tachycardia is basically what it is. You stand up and your heart rate goes mm. too quickly. Basically you're trying to compensate, right? You, you don't have enough blood flow, then low blood pressure, right? So you don't have enough blood flow and then your heart rate has to speed up to appropriately manage that. Um, and it's not necessarily like a health issue, but it's just something like you don't obviously want to do it. Like, I think go right into like a lift. Yeah, it kind of went away. So that's kind of what was fascinating. It used to happen quite a lot, uh, in my early years of lifting, but yeah, anyways, uh, but yeah, it's, it's very fascinating. Like these numbers that we're talking about, um, if you go on Instagram, if you go on, on YouTube and I don't know who you follow, but you probably follow a lot of the people that are in the dude, like four plates and a deadlift it's like warm up not even warm up i mean that's yeah. nothing like five plates is warm up three plates and a bench is warm up yeah uh two plates and overhead press is like any day you know sure let's just do it and it just kind of creates this incredible incredible false expectation for most people getting into this 
um, even if you open websites and you have the you know KC bot generic calculator, then you have the strain standards website where it's sort of elite, advanced, you know, proficient, intermediate, sort of this classification. And then you said like l- world class, and these numbers are insane for mm-hmm. someone. Even when I'm at my leanest, and that's sort of looking at body weight to strength ratio. I'm barely like going above advanced in any of most of the, like, it's insane how ridiculous those standards are compared mm-hmm. to the average. I'm really curious what Abel is going to put together because, and it, it doesn't even correlate. Honestly, like I've seen guys that are way more jacked than I am and they're not as nearly as strong as I am. Like they're right. benching like 185 mm-hmm. and their chest is double the size than mine. It's, it's insane. And well, that's uh, why squatting, I, I, whatever. I, I, yeah, well, that's one of the things Abel and I were talking about is it's very interesting because when I look at a lot of these people in our space, a lot of us, you'd think, so there's more factors. It's generally, you know, there's a lot of factors that go into strength. So when you look at like muscle size, like sprint performance, there's a lot of it, it's, I guess the way I look at uh, size versus strength is the same way I look at like sprint performance versus like sport performance, right? So Sprint performance is very largely tied to genetics. And obviously there's practice, but I'm saying like you, you either have the genetics or you don't. And an example would be like, okay, so let's say Usain Bolt never ran and, and you have crap genetics for running. I don't care if you've trained for 10 years within six months, he's going to destroy you versus let's say, you know, like a Federer, right. For tennis, right. Like one of the best tennis players mm-hmm. ever. Well, he might be the best tennis player ever. One of them. But even if you don't have like the best genetics, it is so technique, uh, you know, sensitive to sport that if you played for 10 years, he'll eventually beat you, but it's not going to be in six months. It's going to, there's so many more skills to it. It's going to take longer, maybe in three years, he becomes a phenom, whatever it is. And so when it comes to strength and size, you know, Jay Cutler, right. Former Mr. Olympia within like a year or two, huge, unbelievable, uh, size, but you get somebody who like a Brad Loomis, maybe from 3DMJ, who he's not that big, but he has practiced the skill of strength so much that he's actually quite impressively strong. And so because of that, and all those reasons, you would think there would be a bigger variability in strength. And obviously, as you mentioned before, we do see people on YouTube and, you know, like a Candido or something where the strength level is just like out of this world. Mm -hmm. But what I'm finding more and more talking to these people is that when you look at them, the size difference almost, or the and the structure difference, all of that appears more significant. I think if you had you, me, Abel, um, Ryan Borstein, Aaron Straker, Jeffrey, Verdi Schofield, all of us next to each other, like bulked up, we'd be probably like, we, we'd all look quite different. You know, we have very different mm-hmm. structures, very different muscle bellies. We look different, but a lot of us, I'm finding that after 10 years, we're hitting very similar strength numbers. You know, we're all kind of benching that 225 to 250 for 10. We're all kind of overhead pressing, you know, 145 to 165 for 10. Like as a lot of it is, is very similar. Mm-hmm. And as short of these YouTube phenoms, um, I'm almost surprised by how similar our strength and, and, you know, general size is, I don't know if you're finding that yourself, but yeah, we wouldn't have to worry too much about taking tons of plates off. Right. Like if we were training together, I think would be pretty similar. And, and we would maybe, even if we did the same weight, the difference in the amount of reps we could get probably wouldn't be that much. Right. Uh, I, I would suspect there, there's a lot of, you know, maybe fiber specific distribution that we have that that's quite different. For example, for me, I'm really good at high rep squatting compared to low rep squatting. Like I suck mm-hmm. at low rep squatting Yeah, like anything below five. It's just so difficult for me, but I can do, I mean, a hundred and what, what I think that I did 115 for like 20 or something. Right. Like, and I can yeah. barely do wow. 130 for, you know, like 140 for five or six. Right. Like it's just some crazy thing. Like, you know, 150 for five will, will freaking kill me. Like if I try to do that, yeah. like, I can do a 150 for, let's say four, three, four reps, but 115, I'll do for 20, no problem. Like, you know, it, I'm I don't the same get way. There, yeah, there, there are a lot of people who are not like that. Yeah, because I remember I, my best front squat, I did 225 for 15. Um, and then, I mean, my front squat, even my low rep was decent. I did 315 for three front squat. But, um, but most, like my barbell back squat, yeah, I, I think I did 345 for like 12. But you do low bar? No, I do high bar. Um, yeah, same, yeah. so, but yeah, I did 345 for 12, but hit like 405, like a handful of times. Like, like just not, you know, if you use like a rep calculator, you'd think I'd be squatting like 450 plus, And I never did. Exactly. 
that, that's yeah. exactly my, my point here is if um, last time I did low bar with, with, um, wrap, uh, with like uh, sleeves, belt and, and everything else, I was with my buddy in, 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 um, in Bulgaria. He, he's also pretty, he's, he's a natural. He's also very experienced, really strong dude. He's squatting. I think his best squat is on 200 kg. My size, my, my weight, my height, you know, sort of similar. Yeah. And um, it's kind of similar weight, but I look bigger than him. Mm. It's just so weird. It's he look, has a denser physique. Okay. And Abel knows him as well. We, we did an event together there and um, he was like squatting pretty heavy. And I'm like, okay, let me just try out low bar. Let me do all this stuff. I think I did a uh, 170 for a single 170 kg for a single. And that was just insane. I just didn't feel like I was really squatting. I felt like my, I was not hitting depth at all. I just, mm. it just felt really weird because normally when I squat, I'm have a pretty narrow stance, very, very deep, uh, kind of ass to grass type of thing. Uh, no belt, pretty upright, high bar position. It's like a different exercise, but I couldn't rep that out. No chance I could rep out five. I would, probably the bar would fall off of me. I'm just right. not used to low bar squatting. But yeah, your point, the same thing with benching. 225, I think I hit about 15, 16 as well. Like that's my max when I just started to rep it out. Mm-hmm. But um, like when it comes to like singles, like one, you know, three plates, I, I don't think I could pull off. I did three plates once in my life. And that's yeah. just, that's it. Like, I, I just don't think I could, I, I never trained for it though. Like, so I don't know if it would be different if I just said one year powerlifting focus, let's just do it. Uh, if my body could tolerate it, maybe I could, but yeah, I think there's definitely some fiber specific stuff going on as well uh, with, with us. Um, but yeah, it, it sounds very similar. It's strange that the numbers are so similar because you're, I think you're taller and heavier than I am as well. Right. So it's like, yeah, so I'm six one and I'm about one ninety. So yeah, like we don't look physically like that like proportionally yeah. by height it's similar but we certainly don't have like similar looking physiques i wouldn't say it would be really cool to have sort of this uh body weight times x multiplier for a lift and see sort of where where everybody stands uh, mm-hmm. because you would kind of think let's say the you know for for like the uh whatever bench you could two uh, X your body weight for a single or one and a half your body weight for a set of 10 or some, something mm-hmm. similar to that. Maybe that would be kind of like an interesting standard because I've heard standards like that being thrown around over the year. Someone says, if you can 175 times body weight in, in, um, in, in kilos and on bench, mm-hmm. that, that would be a re- very respectable bench yeah. or like an advanced lifter. If you can two X, um, uh, your two X body weight in kilos, your squat for reps, that would be very respectable. If you can two and a half X your Deadlift, uh, weight, yeah. uh, deadlifting. I think that sort of, I, I think always felt the only those problem with background. those standards. And I mean, this is certainly not my idea. A lot of people have discussed this is that when you use a body weight multiplier, it favors lighter, smaller individuals. And yeah, yeah. when you use like a Wilk score, it favors more like heavier power lifter. The idea behind the Wilk score is that it's a more fair judgment. And I don't know the exact formula for a Wilk score, but the idea is, you know, basically it's, it's not so skewed towards lighter individuals because you definitely see, like, I've seen guys who were really short. Uh, like I do two guys in college who were like five, four and maybe like one forty five. But I mean, they were pressing like the same weights as the rest of us because they had these short mm-hmm. limbs and they were just like stacked. But like, it, I wouldn't say they were so much stronger, like relative to their weight. Yeah. But it, it gives, I think, an unfair advantage to lighter, shorter people. Um, so that's the yeah, idea. That's again, true. Yeah, I'm not sports. taking into account height. I think like I'm kind of thinking, you know, five foot, 10, 11, six foot type of uh, kind of version of us between right. 10 and 15% body fat would be pretty similar yeah. um, in, in sort of that level. It, it The body fat does make a huge difference. I mean, at 15% body fat, I can definitely feel like I'm a lot stronger. I feel a lot safer lifting heavy as well mm-hmm. compared to being at 10%. I just feel like a little fragile Oh, man good <laughs> like, it's just really weird like you, you definitely feel weaker even though you you look stronger quote unquote to the average person looking at right. you but I, I feel a lot stronger at 15 percent um i have a bias to being being a leaner because i like the you know being lighter and i have five more energy is better my training work capacity is better than being at you know, 16 70 percent so i like to stay in 10 15 but yeah like the there's some isolation from the fat that makes you really feel um, like much stronger and probably your leverage is improved given the fact that you have more, more fat on you as well. To some extent, yeah. if I went up to 20% body fat, I don't even know what my strength would be. I haven't been that high body fat percentage since like 2012 or some 20, 20. It seems like it kind of levels off. Like in the sense, like I don't, cause I've done it. I mean, and when I've like bulked up fatter, 
I mean, obviously you do get stronger, but it's not the same. Like, I think if you're going from like 7% to 12%, you're going to see a big difference. Mm. I think if you then go up to like 20%, you're going to see a difference. Um, but it's, I haven't found that it's, it's like, wow, like you're so much stronger. Like you kind of mostly just get fatter. But that's just my yeah, there, there goes my plan to do go mad for the next right. year. And just try, try to go bear mode. <laughs> I right. know a couple of guys have done bear mode. I think Jeff Nipper talked about it in um, uh, what is his name? Alpha Destiny. Uh, yeah, channel yeah I had a video it. on it a couple of years ago, actually. Yeah, that, that was kind of interesting. I, I, it's funny how also there's some trends. There's always trends in the industry and there's suddenly everybody's training neck. Suddenly everybody's trying to get fatter and bigger and then if suddenly yeah. everybody's trying to get leaner. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like our training is being so affected without us actually under, understanding what's going on. We're being biased naturally through what everybody else is doing. And it's very rare to see someone kind of stick into their own stuff. It's almost yeah. always inspired because I think we're in the we're all bored. Going back to our previous thing, we're all kind of bored to some extent. Like, what yeah. do we actually do at this point? So let's try to copy, right. you know, someone's movement or someone's plan or something because maybe it makes some difference. But it's more just to find something fun about the journey. Yeah, yeah, for sure, man. Well, I'm glad we were able to connect, dude. This is a great conversation. Uh, you know, I'm sure we'll be talking more in the future. But for now, where can people find more of your stuff? Yeah, YouTube. That's the best place. Just if you put in my name, I do a bunch of videos. There are a lot of content on getting leaner, building muscle. I try to keep really things synthesized with research, boiling it down to some practicalities. And I do address a lot of the mindset psychology side of it, which honestly, I don't see a lot of people talk about. In my opinion, mm -hmm. it's about 80% of the game uh, yeah. after you know the fundamentals, uh, which is uh, and how to be consistent and, and all the other factors. So I do a lot of psychology, especially when it comes to eating and, and training as well. So I think people appreciate sort of a different angle, but yeah, I think that's the best place. Awesome. Thanks again, man. I appreciate it, man. Yeah, good to be here.